The veins of the Colorado River whip and weave through the arid west, but decades of demand and new threats from climate change are hitting the river hard. And from the air, it's easy to see the scars. For the nearly 40 million people who depend on the Colorado, drought is likely to be the new normal. Referred to as the lifeblood of the West, it's now the most endangered river in the United States. People are drawing so much water that the river no longer connects with its delta after doing so for six million years. I flew thousands of miles with a group of passionate young students dedicating their careers to environmental protection. We learned from many stakeholders, including Native American communities whose way of life depends on the health of the river. The pilots who flew us believe educating young people is the key to keeping the river from drying up. Everybody knows there's water shortages in the West. What's not understood is exactly what to do about it. These issues are exceedingly complicated. That's why EcoFlight out of Aspen, Colorado, takes students to the air to help them understand what's happening on the ground. The thing that inspired me most to participate in this was just a general love of the earth and wanting to know more about our water resources and how I can help to make our resources more plentiful for everyone in the world. Glen Canyon Dam built in the 1950s is our first destination. It's the second largest reservoir in the United States. The main purpose of this dam is to store water. On one side, it goes to three states. On the other side, it goes to four states and Mexico. That was an agreement written in 1922 called the Colorado River Compact. Ideally, it fills up and then it's allocated to go towards agriculture and household needs. But the amount of water the law promises to each state exceeds its actual flow. That imbalance is exacerbated by the drought in the Western United States, now in its 16th year. The other purpose for the dam is to generate hydroelectric power. This translates to electricity and serves roughly two million people in the Southwest. Over the years, the amount of water being stored here has decreased. That's because there's less snowmelt, evaporation, seepage, and just more demand. More industries and households require the diversion of the river to meet their needs. So I don't like to call it a drought because saying, saying it's a drought makes people think that it's just gonna go away in a few years and it's just not, it's, a, it's built into the system. It's a systemic water deficit that we've built in the Colorado River system management. All that human use has costs. The threats to the Colorado are the same feast around the world. In fact, the UN estimates that by 2025, 1.8 billion people will be living in regions with absolute water scarcity, and two-thirds of the world's population could be living under water stress conditions. But if we recognize the problem, we can take action to avoid this. I think we have enough water in the West to live, to, to grow even more. I mean, we just have to be smarter with it. States can work together. Uh, we don't need to sue each other over it. We just need to work together and make it work. Uh, there's plenty of water for us to live on in the desert right now. There's a strange interplay between technology and sustainability when it comes to water. We certainly need new technology to remain sustainable but there's this paradigm in America of using technology to allow us to do things that are unsustainable and to keep that up. And so we have this idea that we can engineer our way out of every problem instead of trying to adjust our behavior. Our next stop is the Grand Canyon. It's a geologic wonder, so much so that it can be seen from space. But deep in the springs that make up the heart of the Grand Canyon, there's a less visible danger. Uranium mining has occurred in the canyon since it was first approved in 1986, which has resulted in toxic waste spills. Thanks to a government ban in 2012, no further mining is currently allowed. But the mining and nuclear industries are lobbying hard to lift that ban. If this happens, it could threaten a vital water source for thousands of people and 1.7 million acres of Native American tribal homeland. When the guides ask the people if they have any questions about the tour that they just received or the river trip, then, then the visitors will always ask, well, where did these people go? And, and of course, the river guides say, I don't know. Or the park rangers will say, I don't know, they just disappeared. And then for us, it's, you know, if we happen to be in the group, we're just like, you know, I'm right here. <laughs> so our purpose as grassroots and myself is to you know, get educated on these issues and learn about it and bring it back to the communities and help the people understand better of what's happening. 
what's going on with the coal company, how it's expanding out more, and what it's doing to the land, why it's doing this to the land, where's the remediation, where's that at, and what it's doing to the cultural properties in the area. So that's just Peabody. And of course we look at uranium and then, you know, what's the effects of that? How long is it gonna be around? Even though you can't see it, what is the impacts of it on your health? And we see that a lot through cancer and other things that are happening with our health. In August of 2015, the Navajo tribe outside of Durango had their sole source of water poisoned when 3 million gallons of acidic mine waste spilled into the Animas River. It is an incident for which the Environmental Protection Agency has taken fault, but Navajo leaders say the official follow-up for this disaster did not extend equally to their community. When this first happened, I heard about it. I was in my back hole on a farm. And the first thing that came to my mind, this is a big thing that's happening up there. It's going to be here in a, in a day or two. What do I do? Where's the, where's the contingency plan? Where's the next? Where's the alternate source of water? Zero. And during that time, EPA sent out water tanks, water holding tanks for Navajo families to use while the waters are being tested and to, to fill those waters up. And the water, the tanks that they sent had oil or crew residue in the, in, in the watering tank still. And they had told the Navajo, Navajo Nation and the Navajo communities that those tanks were, 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 have been tested, that there's nothing that's gonna contaminate them, that it's, 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 it's perfectly fine to use. And it was just, it, that just shows how federal agencies look at how they respond and how they provide for Native American communities. But despite the hazards of uranium mining, interest in nuclear power is increasing as the demand grows for cheap, reliable electricity. I truly believe that we're supplying a much cleaner source of energy. But many conservationists say the risks outweigh the benefits. The uranium industry can say there's no evidence of contamination. Well, that might have been true 20 years ago. It's certainly not true today. You know, I'm hearing some, some young voices here who obviously you care about the environment, yet you, you're aware of the demand this world has for energy. Um, if, you're, if you're kind of skeptical about the way our private industry is doing things, then finish your degree and come work for us because that's what will make us better, and I'm not kidding. This is where we would recruit. We're not, we're not at war with you. If you guys, it's you with that passion for the environment that needs to come into this industry. Don't stand outside our gate with, you know, signs and tell us we're gonna glow in the dark. Get into the industry. It's the future and, and we need to make it better. We need to make it safe. When it comes to places like Grand Canyon National Park, we think the precautionary principle should apply as it does in medicine, that do no harm. That, you know, if you don't have enough information, err on the side of, of precaution and, and don't uh, go there, uh, knowing full well that th the consequences are irreversible, irretrievable, permanent contamination of groundwater. I think the most important part is going to be people collaborating and working together and learning to find ways to compromise so that we can all have our goals met as best as possible, which is going to be the hardest part by far. I think what touched me the most was um, when we heard uh, the native speakers talking about, about water and their way of life and how marginalized they are in our society. Their needs aren't really taken into account like uh, the needs of most people in the United States. Um, they're almost second class citizens and you know, they're a people who've existed on this land for thousands and thousands of years and ha didn't have to do water diversions, didn't have to um, grow water intensive crops in the desert and they, they lived and they didn't leave a huge impact on the landscape. We, we flew, flew over a lot of areas that would make you feel not so hopeful about uh, drought situations, climate change, population densities, people that really are not changing their points of view and certainly have a different point of view than I do. But I come away from this uh, meeting we just had today most hopeful about our young people and that's why I'm so thrilled that we have this small program because it reaches uh, not as many people as we want yet, but I was so moved by the takeaway from the people on this last uh, trip. 
The source of water we draw from our taps connects us all, whether we see it or not. Communities like the Navajo Nation do not take their water for granted, and as we enter the era of water scarcity, no one can afford to. But if we understand the issues, we can insist on policies and practices that keep our basis of life from drying up.